Hey everybody, it's Greg Rice. We're here at Nexus's headquarters in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and you're tuned in to another episode of Rhode Island Business Spotlight with, drum roll please, Michael D. Crane. How are you, Greg? How's it going, Mike? Good, how are you? Good, good. Good. For those of you that don't know, Mike is the second best attorney in Rhode Island, okay? Just behind Steve Conti. Oh, now they get three then, behind Steve and Murray. Okay, third oh, best yeah. attorney. So Mike and Nexus have a great relationship, and what I wanted to do today is kind of get to know Mike more than just the attorney. Okay, so you came to us from, from California, right? Yes. Back in the day? I uh, was born uh, born and raised in San Francisco, just south of San Francisco, a small town called Foster City. Um and uh, lived there uh, until I went to college in, in the Bay Area, uh, to St. Mary's, which is now a uh, basketball, quote-unquote, known ah, commodity. Yep. Um, I wouldn't say a powerhouse. I think we've made the Sweet 16 once. Uh, moved to L.A. for four years, uh, came back to the Bay Area for another four years, and then came to Rhode Island for law school, met my wife uh, towards the end of third year, and stayed. So that's your whole life in 20 seconds. There it is. That's the end you of know. the interview. Yeah. So that was exciting. <laughs> so back to California, to, was it Foster City? Foster City, yes. What was your uh, your first job that you ever had? First job I ever had was Ace Hardware. Okay. So I, uh, I turned uh, 16 years old on June 15th. I think it was a Friday, Saturday, something like that. Um, and uh, the Monday after, my dad came in my room, knocked on the door, woke me up and said, let's go. And one of his really good friends owned the Ace Hardware, and he drove me over there, dropped me off, and said, "Here's your first job. You're 16 years old." Wow! So I worked there for the uh, for the for the summer and uh, into school for a little bit. And what were you doing at Ace? What were they like? Stocking shelves, facing they call it, which is moving all the products forward. Um, you know, working the cash register, whatever I was told to do. I was 16. I, I didn't know anything. I didn't even know anything about hardware. Did um, they hire you because your last name was Crane? <laughs> he hired me because of my dad's kid, and my dad wanted him to actually beat me up, and that's exactly what happened. Cool. For for a while, I got beat up. So. And after Ace, what was your next job? I worked uh, at Molly Stones, which is a uh, grocery, kind of like Dave's Marketplace. Okay. Um, out there, I worked there for a long time, a couple years. Um, I was uh, a bagger, uh, fancy we call it courtesy clerk when courtesy when you're in the industry. Clerk. Um, <laughs> so I bagged groceries for two years. Loved that job. That was a lot of fun. Um, and then uh, went off to college. Um, that ended uh, right before I went off to college. In college, you were dead set on being in law. No, actually, um, never even thought about law. I was dead set on being a communications major. Uh, oh. So I did uh, all. I did radio. Um, I uh, for four years while I was at St. Mary's. The last two and a half years, I did all of the play-by-play -play announcing for bas women's basketball and then men's basketball. No kidding. Um, yeah, and then football. Um, we had a football team back then. At the college, you said? At the college, yeah. And I did volleyball, um, soccer, you name it. I did all the sports. I did public address. Uh, and then uh, when I graduated, the reason why I moved to L.A. was I worked for Fox Sports. Mm. Um, so I had every um, sports fan's dream, which is I went, uh, we, when Fox Sports started its first cable channel, I helped start that in October of 1996. And uh, for 40 hours a week, I got paid way too much money because it was when everything was going online. Mm. So we were all considered union employees, but we were working on highlights. Mm. Um, <laughs> so we would watch. We got paid to watch games wow. for uh, six hours a day, um, and you got paid for eight because it was a union gig. But the games were over, so yeah. you could go home. Um, and uh, did that for uh, four years um, and moved up um, mm. through that. But uh, I wanted to go back home to San Francisco, so the the software company. Um, that provided the software we used, um, hired me and moved me back to San Francisco. Hmm. Uh, so I did that for four years and then uh, decided I wanted to work for myself. Hmm. So communications, and then you said, ah, highlight reels are fun, hanging out's fun, but I want more purpose? Or what was the, like the, the, yeah. the switch? It was maybe more purpose, and the hours are crazy in television. Got I would work 3 p.m. to 11 p.m., um, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. Money was great. I mean, I was 22 to 25 years old, living in L.A. We knew where every happy hour was, seven <laughs> days a week, because L.A. had happy hour all over the place. You knew all the spots to go. You weren't working until 3 o'clock. You were off at 9 or 10. Right. So you're going out every night. You're right. getting home at 2. You could still sleep till 10. 
You'd wake up, you'd go for a run on the beach, mm -hmm. you'd come back, eat lunch, go to work. And you work three, mi you know, three miles from work. I mean, it was, it was an absolute dream. Um, <laughs> I won't lie. Uh, there's nothing bad about it. Uh, but I figured, you know, um, I, I wanted to do something different. I knew I didn't want to work those hours. I knew eventually I wanted a family. Um, and I felt, you know, I wanted to be around kid, my, my kids and, mm -hmm. and working, you know, working off and odd hours, you know, probably wouldn't have played into that as much as I had wanted to. Um, so I took the job with a software company um, and, and went back home. And then when I was there, I was like, corporate America is just not for me. Shit. Um, yeah, you know. Um, so my mentor said, you should just go, you know, get a license in something. He said, law, um, you know. Maybe, you know, uh, so, you know, whatever um, it may be, real estate, anything. And I was like, oh, lost. Looked into it and uh, decided, oh, I'll go to law school. Wow. And, and I'll open up my, I didn't care where I went, just wanted to get in somewhere, and I knew I was going to open my own law firm. And what year was that? That was, I went to law school in 2004, and graduated in 2007. Hmm. Yeah. Right. And, and what about, like, I look at law school like 18 hours a day, you know, coffee, books, notebooks everywhere, like no life locked up in your room. Like, is that the way it is or was it a little more flexible than I'm saying? Or It's flexible, a little bit more flexible in that I would say from, I would say five days a week, you're probably studying 10 hours a day. Um, you know, the sixth day, you're probably putting in a good four or five hours. Uh, but, I mean, you know, you're letting loose one or two nights a week, Got it. Um, getting out, you know, just enjoying yourself, hanging out, you know, with whoever, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and you do have that, that opportunity to relax, but you're not, you know, for the three and a half months of each semester, you're not going anywhere, you're not traveling, right. you know, you're not doing a lot of that. Um, you, are, you are studying and, you, you know, you're prepping for the exams and, and really, um, you know, prepping to prepare yourself to, to take the bar exam. Mm. Um, so, and I didn't know where I was taking the bar exam, you know, I was nervous because it was California, it wasn't Rhode Island. Mm. Would I be licensed in just Rhode Island, um, or or what would I do? So hmm. it was, uh, you know, that part was was a little bit overwhelming. Where would I end up? Because I was co I was going back to San Francisco every summer to work. Hmm. Um, so there, there was there was that, um, you know, that 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 was a little different for me. Plus I was older, so I had already been through a lot. I knew how the working world was. Um, so there that that was kind of my kind of. Advantage? Th thoughts. Yeah, it was an advantage, but my thoughts were like, where am I going to end up? Where, you know, what am I going to do? But my advantage was, you know, if any law school teachers see this, sorry. You know, they would talk about the real world. And I was like, no, that's not how the real world works. Um, but, you know, they all went straight from their law schools to, to being a professor, which is mm. different. Um, so we're not, not really a knock on them, just, I think, a, a lack of understanding certain, yeah. certain issues, certain aspects. And most students come up, you know, high school and then undergrad and then law school, so they're limited exposure and you're like you know you got the fox sports you got the software company living in two different major cities ace hardware courtesy clerk yeah. like you got the world by the balls there so, yeah i had had a i had had a wealth of experiences i'd moved around um i had obviously come from california to to rhode island so very different um you know environments uh so uh so it was you know I, I felt that, that you know, in, in learning things, uh, you know, putting all of those experiences, you know, and applying them to what I was learning, you know, did, did help. I wouldn't say it made it any better. I think it just made it different. Hmm. And what would you say to the folks at home, maybe they're thinking about going to law school? What is the difference today with folks pursuing a career in law as opposed to 20 years ago? I would say, I, I don't think there's much of a, much of a difference. Um, I don't think it's changed much. I think the issue is how much can you swallow in, in student loans, um, um, you know, and, and are you willing to apply yourself? Because I think most people could pass the bar exam if they went to law school. Really? I, I think if you apply yourself, most people are smart enough. Most people, you know, if they apply themselves, can, can figure that out. I think it's do you want to, can, can you swallow, you know, the, the student loans and are you willing to accept that when you get out? Because I think that that's the biggest hurdle that a lot of people face. How much does it cost to... to go to law school these days? You'd probably, probably somewhere between 120 and 150. Um, most door? private schools out the door. Yeah. A little less if you go to a public school or a state school. So that's three years you're saying? Three years, yes. So not bad, 40, 50 Gs a year? Correct. I mean, once you get, you know, once you get eight to 10 years out, you're going to be fine. So hmm. you're going to have figured things out. So when you, you, you know, you pass the bar, you move back to Rhode Island, 
I stayed in Rhode Island, took the bar, Rhode Excuse Island, me. Massachusetts bar exams. You, stay, you get it here. What was the first uh, job that you had, or where were you first employed? So I worked at a small law firm in Cumberland, okay. Rhode Island, called Walsh, Burley, and Nault. Oh, yeah, I know uh, them. Yeah, so I was there for about four Andy, and a half years. Andy Nault? Andy Nault, yes. Yeah. Um, so I was, yeah, so um, Andy was actually uh, just a couple years older than me. Um, but uh, worked worked there uh, for four, four and a half years. Uh, and then uh, I did, that's where I started. I, I was doing, they focused primarily on, on real estate mm. transactions and a lot of uh, state planning, elder law and Medicaid planning. Um, and they're great at it, they're fantastic at it. And I was doing a lot of the overflow work. Um, and, you know, um, uh, I left there to go to a firm in Worcester, Massachusetts, um, that started up. Um, and they said, oh, we got all this, we got all this business, we got all this money, come on, come work for us. And then four and a half, five months later, they're closing their doors because they didn't have it. Um, so uh, two months before my first child was born, uh, which was a little nerve wracking. Um, but uh, both those places is where I started um, doing a lot of, you know, the landlord tenant work mm. um, and a lot of the real estate work and real estate litigation. And do you enjoy what you do now for, for us and for many landlords, all these evictions? You're doing what? You're top five in the state, according to Steve, as far as volume goes, right? I'm doing anywhere, I'm doing probably now about six or seven hundred a year between Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And do you like it? I do. I like it. Um, I, 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 I do enjoy it. Um, I enjoy the interactions. I enjoy um, everything that comes in. I do a lot of subsidized housing work. Mm -hmm. I love that part. Um, that part of it, I, I, you know, my, my clients and, and people are fantastic. I love the part of working with um, businesses, property management businesses. I think the challenging aspect, and this is why, why I have so much respect for Stephen Murray, mm -hmm. is the individual one-offs. Yes. That's the part that, that can be uh, uh, frustrating. Um, some of them you love, 50% of them you love, and 50% of them, you know, this is where Stephen Murray just shine. Um, they can be extremely tough and frustrating, and, and they have the personality to really um, take those on. But I love working with property management companies like yourself. Um, and, you know, I work with your Fall River mm -hmm. organization, um, Lindsay and Jose. They're great. They're fantastic. Um, but, um, you know, that, that's, that's the one challenge. But I, I wouldn't trade working with the um, companies and, and the subsidized housing providers for, for so anything. So define to the folks at home what a one-off is. Like you're saying Joe Schmo Landlord and Betty the Tenant, like – yeah, no so, relationship, yeah. No, you just yeah, Joe Schmo Landlord comes in, he owns one three family, right. and you know why he bought it. He bought it because he wanted to live on the first floor, right. and or, you know, he bought two units because he was living on the first floor, one, bought another one, and that way he can pay his mortgages, have the real estate, and he doesn't have to worry about if he loses his job or right. the income's coming in, but they come in because they get that one tenant who isn't paying rent, but... They were, you know, it's their first eviction or their third or fourth eviction, and of course they don't want to run to court and pay, you know, the five hundred bucks for the eviction. Right. So they're two, three, four months down. So now they're upset. Right. And they want to talk, you know, they got they want to call you every day. They're going to send you angry emails on a Sunday. <laughs> um, and I get it, like, but when they first come in, you have you you have to explain to them, hey, listen, you bought a business, and I don't think a lot of them understand that. They think they bought an investment. Tell them right now. You've, bought, you've purchased a business, and every business is going to have gains and losses. And when you come to me or Steve or Murray, we're only going to deal with your loss. <laughs> we're going to try to get you to the point get you a gain. where you get back to the gain, but we're here for the loss. So I, I, always tell, I always start off by saying, listen, you've come to see me. I'm not going to give you good news. Mm -hmm. So I had one lady. This is my favorite. This is one of my top three or four favorite stories. Great. One lady came in. I said, you got, she's, you know, oh, you know. She's calling every day. She was referred over by a very reliable person. And I felt bad for her until we get to court. And she hands me my check for the 500 bucks. And she's upset about the whole situation. And I've talked to her on Saturday nights, Sunday nights, yep. you know, Monday mornings. I've gotten the nasty emails. Mm -hmm. I've gotten the nasty text messages. And she goes, here's 500 bucks. And I'm going to tell you what. Go buy a new front door to your, to your office. She goes, that thing was too heavy when I came by. Wow. And she walked out. And that kind of, to me, just kind of, Murray and, you know, that's Murray and Steve get that all the time. And I'm just like, listen, I don't need that. I yeah. just, you know. Um, 
So I will represent the one-offs. I do a lot of one-offs. I really like a lot of them. Got it. I really, um, and I have a lot of respect and appreciation, yeah. especially for what seems to be. I'm, I'm not, you know, this, you know, um, you know, don't cringe when I say this. I'm not trying yeah. to be sexist, but there's a lot of single mothers mm -hmm. who purchase yep. two, three, four families to take the, the, the um, yeah. rent payments to pay their mortgage and provide for their children. Perfect. I love those ladies. I love when they come in. Yep. They're, they're wonderful to work with. You want to work with them. Yep. Um, but on the flip side, you get 30% of, and not, not now I'm away from the single mothers, I'm not, but 30% of people in that situation, whether it's a, you know, male, female, whoever, who have done that, and they just, you know, they can't control themselves. They've already texted the tenant nasty things. They've right. said nasty things to the tenant. And, and how, do you, how do you walk it back? Right. How do you walk that back? And then, you know, that's the, the client you walk in and, you know, um, that's, this is something we all do is you, you try to develop a rapport and a relationship with the tenant so that you can resolve the case. You owe that to your client. Right. And the client just comes over and starts yelling at you. You're oh, being friendly. Spot. Why are you being friendly? They don't deserve it. So that's, you know, that's, you know, and, and really I think the, the bottom line is what I'm trying to say. That's where Stephen Murray and, sure. you know. Uh, that, 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 that's where they shine. But that's why I love representing the subsidized housing and the, and the property managers because they understand the game. They yeah. understand the system. More conditioned. And, yeah, and we can work with that and, and, and proceed that So way. are you saying that you'll say no to some clients if you feel like they're not a good fit for your system? I'll say the no the second or third time. Absolutely. Got it. If you've dealt with them and they're not improving, they're not learning, they're still giving you the nasty grams, you'll say, listen, Mrs. Jones, I might not be the best fit for Correct. you. Correct. Which so, is good. Yeah. We I, do that too. Yeah, we we let plot, uh, property clients go. We don't want to, but if they're being consistently like negative and accusatory and competitive, and it's just like, I don't need that. Correct. We got six hundred clients that appreciate us and love us and let us do our job. Absolutely, jobs. yeah. The negative energy, I'm just not, not a. Not you a get big enough fan of that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So absolutely, and and I like to, you know, I've got two young children. I like to go home at five. Yeah. So I'm not afraid to just go home at five and shut it off till eight or nine. Yeah. And if I feel there's enough emails I got to answer at eight or nine o'clock, I'll answer them at eight or yeah. nine o'clock. Which you did for me last night. <coughs> nine so, thirty, I I sent him an email and he texts me within like ten seconds with so, the answer. Yeah. Well, you know, I was I was already you know working. So point one it was for perfect. that. Hey, no worries. <laughs> uh, don't worry. Um, but uh, you know, another <laughs> that leads me into another. Like, I got I got to tell this one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, my second child was born, and I had oh, this nice uh, elderly lady, I'll never forget her, um, and I was helping her, we got through the whole eviction, and we were ready for the execution, which is, for those of you who don't know the piece of paper that, that you need to move them out, that's how I always define it. Um, and uh, so I ordered the execution, but uh, you know, I couldn't, uh, I, I couldn't grab it to, to get it to her, and my assistant was, was out that week um, in finals, it was the beginning yep. of December. Um, so both my children born on the same day, four years apart. Really? Yeah. So uh, I, I, I know, December 5th. Um, so uh, I, I get it to her like on December 8th or 9th. And she calls me and, she, and, and the constable calls her. And she calls me, you know, like a week later when I'm finally back in the office and, and rolling. And she goes, you know, she goes, if I had known your wife was having a kid, I never would have hired you. I said, all right. Wow. I said, thank you. <laughs> I just laughed. I'll, I was just like, oh, what do you do? <laughs> so. So you get that those types of comments. Oh yeah, all the time. So you get you get people say the strangest things. So. Is it usually? Let me ask you this: Is it usually? Is the crazier person usually the owner or the tenant? Or is it the both? Well, the owners are my clients. So I think I might have to take the fifth on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, how about in your experience, which have been crazier more often? I would say it's probably split down the middle, yeah. depending on you know, depending on the type of case. Um, the owners provide the funnier stories because they always provide the funnier fixes or the funnier yeah. attempts to resolve a situation. But uh, th there are tenants that are you know, um, you know. I always say there's probably. 30% of tenants that are habitual, mm -hmm. and then I would say 5 to 10, probably 5% of tenants that just, for whatever reason, you know, they, they should, you know, obviously they can't be, but they probably shouldn't be tenants. Um, Got it. Um, they're just, I mean, they're just mean, they're nasty, they ruin mm -hmm. apartments, they're mean to people, mm -hmm. they don't know how to, um, you know, communicate, you know, even just try to communicate effectively or, or try mm -hmm. to work with, with the landlord. I mean... 
you know, you get landlords in your office, they're on the verge of tears. Like, what do I right. do with this person? I can't get them out. And then you got to tell them they're going to be there for another six weeks. They're going to be least. there for another eight weeks, at least. And, um, you know, that's, that's difficult, you know, to, to deal with. I, I think it's kind of split down the middle. There are owners who shouldn't be owners, and there are tenants who, who shouldn't be tenants. True. Um, but I understand why they're owners. But, you know, you go back to the thing, you don't realize you bought a business. Right. Um, you, you, you really don't. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's too bad. Um, I did have one owner once come in, and uh, a tenant comes up to me and goes, I don't have a shower. And I go to the owner, and the owner goes, eh, they have a shower. It's middle of summer, probably 90 degrees and humid out. They have a shower. I go, I go, he says you have a shower. They show me a picture. The guy ran the garden hose from the outside into the shower and hung it up until the plumber could get there. I'm like, and he wanted to go to trial. I said, I don't, we're not, we're, we're going to skip trial. We're going to skip trial. Yeah, we're, we're just going to waive rent and go. And he said, what do you mean we're waving rent? I said, well, you're going to owe her money if we take the uh, yeah. hose for a shower to trial. <laughs> I'm like, you got to What city kidding. was that in? I don't remember, to be honest. I don't remember. Was it Rhode city. Island? Oh, it was Rhode Island. Oh. Absolutely, it was Rhode <laughs> Island. It was six, so it was Providence, Pawtucket, Central Falls, Woonsocket, something like that. Where do you see the most of your cases originate from? Most of mine are Providence. So I represent a lot of subsidized housing providers around Providence. What about the one-offs, like the individual landlords? Where are the majority of them from? I do a lot of Woonsocket and Pawtucket for one-offs in some Providence. Um, a, a lot of Providence. I have the Providence Department Association. Yep. Um, so I do a lot of work for them. So that's that's where I get a lot of my Providence. Um, but I do do a lot of Woonsocket as well. Um, so some Cranston. Um, but uh, the majority is, I would say, Providence in, in Woonsocket. Is there a city or town that you haven't gotten an eviction from? Maybe something down south, um, but I've pretty much done, I've pretty much hit all the towns in, in the state. Wow. Um, uh, even like, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of like the most. Even Wyoming. Wyoming. Yeah. So, because when I got the Wyoming, Situate, I said, Situate I've done. Exeter. Exeter I've done. So. West Greenwich. West Greenwich I've done. All oh. of that. What's the smallest town in Rhode Island? Well, Central Falls is one by one, but I think population, I don't know if it's the smallest town. Hmm. do look that up. Yeah, but square footage, I know it's Central Falls. So. Central Falls is very interesting. Um, we don't have too much business there, ironically. I don't either. You would think, like, with all the multis, it's literally all multis, that we would just get flooded with calls, especially that you could see us from Central Falls. Like, you can be on Broad Street yeah. and see our office. But for some reason, we've... I think there's two reasons. I think, you know, Central Falls is a very hardworking group of people. Yeah. Um, a lot of, I think a lot of the, um, you know, families purchase multifamilies, you know, for the mortgage for the second and third units to own the building. And they're very, they do a very good job. They're very successful at it. It's true. Um, and I think, you know, I go back to the hardworking. You know, they're, they're hardworking and they do what they need to do. Mm -hmm. um, they have their tight-knit community. Um, and, and true. you know, it's, it's I, I think that's, you know, I think that's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's nice. It's good to see. I think Central Falls is, a, a good, is, is good for that. Um, so and it's, it's an impressive little community. It is. Um, which is nice. It um, needs work, but it's on the way up. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Well, it's all hardworking people. And you see a lot of it. Even when you do get one, you see where it's a parent. You know, maybe they're getting evicted. You know, the child, uh, for whatever reason, is 17 or 18, always going to college. Always mm -hmm. doing what they, what they need to do. So, you know, Central Falls is a, good, is, is a great little place. Shout out to Central Falls. Yeah. So, so do you get emotionally affected by all these cases? These 600 cases have to take a toll on you so that when you go home, you're like, oh. There are. Uh, or I, do you feel like. As a group, no. But the, there were up until I would say probably a year, year and a half ago, uh, I would, it would, you know, the emotional toll in certain cases. Um, but I, 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 I thought I was getting over that hump, um, but I really have because I have a case right now that's a perfect example that normally would keep me up at night, um, and I'm just it just rolls right off my back. Um, hmm. We're still we're still doing the move out right now, so um, but it's just a tenant who is just extremely difficult to deal with. Got it. Um, and uh, you know, posting all over Facebook, um, you know, just just going a little bit a little bit crazy. Nuts. But, uh, yeah, but um, you know, that's uh, you know, not not even not even that and I anymore. It's just like you know, I asked it is. Steve Conti. You can see the, our interview with Steve 
Um, I watched it. It's great. It was he, great. Getting if he ever got attacked or physically assaulted, yeah. he said no. Is that the same for you? I've never been attacked. Or like ex pushed. Or nope. Nope. Never. Uh, never anything. But my favorite story is uh, Murray. When I first uh, moved in with Murray, I went to court with him one day, and there was a guy with uh, three teardrops. And uh, he told me, he goes, I just, you know, told me, just got out of jail, this and that. I said, listen, I said, you know, well, rent hasn't been paid. We, you know, we got to move you, you know, so, so let's try to work something out. And he goes, I'm not working anything. I'm like, come on, let's work something out. Let's go in front of the judge. He looks at me, he goes, I just got out of jail for murder. Do you think I'm worried about what a judge is going to tell me? I said, okay. So I said, but I want to avoid it. He goes, well, you think I'm going to worry about what you're going to tell me? I said, nope. All right. <laughs> but I always remember that. That was the closest where I was like, ah, I probably should just shut up and yeah. walk, walk away. And How Murray, that, you're taking this guy yeah. to trial. How did that result? <laughs> I think they went to trial or something, or, or Murray just gave him an extra couple weeks or, or something. It was Murray's client, so I didn't have authority to give him a couple extra weeks. Um, so I just went to Murray and said, hey, your client doesn't know me. So, and he's got you know, teardrops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I said, all yours, Murray. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So does he, Murray, you're, you consider him your role? Rhode Island mentor? Uh, yeah, Mur uh, yeah, definitely. So it's Steve, too. I mean, I talk to Steve a lot as well. Um, but but Murray, definitely, I mean, you know, sharing space with him, him opening up his office and, and opening up his, his practice the way he has has just been it's an absolute godsend, you know, for myself, for my family, um, the whole nine yards. I, you know, couldn't be more appreciative of and grateful for, for what he's done um, and the knowledge he's taught me and being yeah. able to expand from certain types of evictions. Um, it's just fantastic. And he gives me, he's doing only evictions now, so anything that's not eviction related, he just hands over. So it's, it's, it's been very nice. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's been fantastic. Um, so I'm, I'm forever grateful and, and respectful of him. And, and Murray, and his last name, let the folks... Oh, Murray Garaboff, so, which, which many people obviously know. Yeah. So. so, Mike, tell us about the coronavirus. Tell us about your involvement. You were part of that group, if you will, of advisors to the governor and to the chief justice about how you think the eviction should be handled, the procedures, and now tell us about maybe the safe harbor program. Take us back to, you know, the beginning. All right, so um, so the, obviously the coronavirus pandemic hits, and... Um, on or about? On or about. Mar Mar it's not on or about. Everything shut down. March 13th was the last day in court. March 13th. March 13th, everything shuts down. And they give an opening date of, I think it was sometime in April, if I'm not mistaken. And then they moved it to June 1st. Um, uh, so the courts reopened on, on June 2nd. But in the meantime, I think the first two or three weeks, um, I think it actually it was four weeks. Um, so the first two weeks, it was staycation, hang out with the kids, you know, tell people, you know, give people bad news, you know, every so often. It was real quiet. Um, but as, as we started ramping up, um, you know, Chief Judge uh, Lafazia, the Chief Judge of the District Court, decided there needed to be an eviction task force. Um, so Murray and Paul Ragost, who's another attorney, were, were already on it. Um, and then I got a call. I got asked to join. Um, they were already on it from on the task force. previous time? Well, they had been known as well because they've done, you know, Murray's done this for 50 years. Got it. So he's just the right-hand man to the... To everybody. To government. Yeah. Um, so they were aware. And then Paul, um, they, you know, had done this for so long. They had asked Paul. And then um, they had brought myself in, Judge Smith, uh, Judge DeBose. Uh, and then a couple of the clerks. Did you feel, um, like, really legit and honored to be asked? Yeah, it was an absolute great honor. That's, um, that's amazing. Yeah, no, it was fantastic. Um, it was good to get to know everybody. Um, and, um, the, you know, it was, it, was, it was good because, you know, they, I was able to bring in kind of the subsidized housing aspect because mm. that's the majority of, of what I do. Um, so we came in. And um, Where was the we, first meeting? The first meeting was, everything was on Zoom and WebEx. Oh, okay. So... Our WebEx. Courts are all WebEx. So we did WebEx, and uh, we, we really, we logged in, and it was, all right, so the courts are going to open June 2nd. Mm -hmm. Here's what we think is going to happen. We're going to have, you know, we're going to have three different areas. It's going to be the first set of cases, uh, which are the cases that were scheduled between March 13th and whenever the courts opened, so June 2nd, you know. And then we're going to, so we're going to get through those cases. There's, 100, there's 360 cases. It just turned out 180 that were in Providence, and 180 for the rest of Rhode Island. Wow. And then they knew they were going to shut down Wakefield, Newport, and uh, Wakefield and Newport and move it to Kent. So it was going to be 180 in Providence and 180 in Kent. And they knew they could hear anywhere from, at the time, at first when we started out, it was six cases a day. Luckily, we got up to 12, which I know everybody's saying that's not a lot, but... 
it's not. instead of a two-month backlog with six cases a day, it was a one-month backlog with, you know, 12 cases a day. So we knew we'd get to that, and then we knew that there would be um, non-payment cases for letters that were mailed. Um, when I, well, you could never, you never had to stop mailing letters unless it was a CARES Act covered property. Mm. CARES Act covered property, I tell everybody, is, you know, federally insured, federally backed, or any any subsidized housing property because mm-hmm. anything that's considered a VAWA property, which is Violence Against Women's Act, so any of those properties you couldn't mail anything except for a non-compliance. Mm-hmm. So we knew there was going to be thirty to thirty-five percent of units um, were uh, non-CARES Act covered properties. So we knew that those would probably get us close to the August twenty-eighth date when you could start filing CARES Act covered properties. Go ahead. Is that date going to stick? That date sticked, yes. Nothing new has come out. Trump said something a week and a half ago, issued, signed an executive order on moratoriums. So that means starting on the 28th, you can now send five-day demands to your federally... So the way it works is you can start five... You So the CARES Act expires on July 25th. So like I said, any CARES Act covered property, you could not send a straight termination notice mm-hmm. or a... a a non pay a demand notice. So five day, ten day, or fourteen day demand notice. Once the CARES Act expired on July twenty fifth, you could send those notices, but they could not terminate a tenancy before thirty days after the CARES Act ended. Mm. So demand notices in in all states and ten and fourteen day notices in Rhode Island are called notices to quit or proposed terminations of tenancy. Notices to quit are considered terminations of tenancy. So, and the reason why I'm using notice to quit, even though we don't in Rhode Island, I'll, I'll get to in a second. So those could not expire until 30 days after the CARES Act ended, which is the 28th. Mm. So you could send a 10-day demand notice on July 20, I think it was the 7th, because the 25th was a Saturday. Um, so you could not send it till then, but if it was a 10-day, you had to change the language to a 30-day. And if it was a 14-day, which is for public housing, same, distance, same difference. Got it. 30 days. So now, you've got the five-day question. If you go to the Seminal case for five days in Rhode Island, they call it a notice to quit. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a gray area because it doesn't have termination language in it, just as an eviction may be instituted against you. But to be safe, we decided to make the five-day demand notice a notice to quit because that's the way it is in the case law. Got it. So that could not expire until the 28th. So you could change the five-day demand notice to a 30-day. Okay. So basically, all those notices can't expire until 20, you know, 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th. To be safe, just build in a few days. So they can't expire until the 28th. So all your 10 days, all your 5 days, all your public housing could theoretically expire on the 28th. Because mm-hmm. everybody who hasn't paid from March 13th, mm-hmm. or you didn't file before March 13th, up and through July 20, 25th, now the 26th, they can file. So there's going to be an influx of cases because that's 65% of rentals in Rhode Island starting on that date. That's mm. why we use that date, knowing that's going to be what we're calling phase three, where just the floodgates are going to open. Mm. I mean, th- they are going to open. There's there's no question about it. I've heard some of the numbers of people that just uh, are not collecting. I've heard there are some some larger management companies, they're not collecting 31% of rents. That's the highest number I heard. People just not paying. We've got tenants going online because now everything is online, and you can do a you can go to the registry, and they're looking to see if their, cl- if their landlord's had federally insured or federally backed mortgages, and if they did, they've actually sent text messages to the landlord. Hey, see, so you have an FHA loan, a VA loan. Guess what? I'm not paying you rent. I'm going to move out right before you file. I've seen it's it's crazy. But so the 28th comes, um, and there's going to be a ton of cases filed. So we had to prepare for to that find as well. A ton. Do you think it should be more than the 360? Oh, absolutely. You think it's going to be thousands? I think it's going to be. I would think there's between. August 28th and November 1st, I would say normally there's about 1,000 cases filed a month. I would say it might it might raise to 50% to 1,500. Oh, okay. So to 2,000. I say it could get up to 2,000, but we'll see. And, and we'll see how many people want to negotiate. Yeah, because we're the goal. Right, because we're already into middle to end of September on dates for non-payment cases. So it's backed up um, already. So uh, if this... If you're listening at home and thinking, I'm one of these guys that's filing after the 28th, they're going to be in court in October? Yeah, you're going to be in court in October. So work Maybe with your, November? Yeah. So when I get, you know, so work with your tenant. Don't, like, just bite your tongue till it bleeds. Don't get mad at the tenant. Don't upset the tenant because if they dig in their feet, it's going to it's gonna 
hurt even more. And that's where we'll get into the safe harbor program. And, and uh, you know. So let's get in that. My next question so. is what. Uh, you let know, me clear. Let me clear up where, okay. we're, where we're going with that because I don't yep. want to leave that. Sure. So the eviction task force, we were we were given this this you know these dates of what we needed to do, um, and when we needed to do it. And basically, our our main goal was coming up with the documents necessary on the fly, mm. necessary to reopen the courts to ensure that the proper cases were being filed, the proper documentation was filed, mm -hmm. and that. Um, nobody was being misled, mm -hmm. um, and nobody was 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 trying to cheat the system. Mm -hmm. um, so there are affidavits that people need to file, which the affidavits could get you in trouble. Well, you know, some attorneys will tell you it's just an affidavit, but they're affidavits. You're signing one of the pains and penalties of perjury. Um, so we had to come up with all this documentation. We really weren't the dates and. Um, the amount of cases per day and what was going to happen in the hallways. We didn't. We had very little, very little to no input on, on all of that. We mm -hmm. could discuss it, um, but we just, you know, a lot of it came from, you know, came from above us um, of what we were able to do. We heard no earlier than anybody else when the courts were going to be when open, when when you know if the courts were going to be open, if there was going to be an extension or what they were going to allow. The only thing we knew is everybody was going to have to be six feet apart, only two people per elevator. And 12 cases a day. That's that's all. That's all we were told. Mm -hmm. And we had to make sure no CARES Act covered property cases were filed unless it was a non-compliance case. Um, and we had to make sure that the 180, the 360 outstanding cases were were dealt with mm -hmm. in a timely manner. And how are we going to deal with those cases? So really, all the other directives came came from above us. So above us, meaning the governor, the governor, the chief judge, um, you know, and the chief justice of the Supreme Court. So was the governor on your WebEx calls? No, just no. the chief judge. Chief judge was on was on a few of them. I um, mean, she's she's great. She's fantastic. Um, she's very realistic. Um, and you know, oh, Tiffany Antock Emery was also on that. She represented tenants. Um, Got it. it was a really just it was a fantastic group of people to put there, because, you know, and and this can you know really what they wanted is they said we need everybody in the middle. You you can't be too far to one side or the mm -hmm. other side because this isn't going to work if we do it. But did you so. find, you don't have to name names, but did you <coughs> find that there was some folks that wanted this and other people that wanted that, that amongst your group or your, nope. your consulting there, that there was any... Nope, thrills? chemistry was fantastic. It was, it was positive? Absolutely positive and fantastic. Was, did it lean tenant? Did it lean landlord? Or did it go down the middle? I think looking at us, we felt we went down the middle, but I'm sure if you ask landlords, it leaned tenant, and if you ask tenants, it leaned landlord. Got it. So it's just a matter of opinion. Exactly. But I, I think we, I, I, you know, and obviously I'm a little biased. Um, well, but. I'm a landlord and a property manager, and I have to say that I felt it was pro-landlord because of how early the court opened up. I mean, you look at next door Massachusetts, next door Connecticut, still closed and possibly could be pushed back further than October 15th or whatever. October 18th for Massachusetts. October 18th. And then Connecticut is open. But I don't think Massachusetts has another extension built into their uh, statute. I think that would have to go back to their, um, back to back to Congress. But that's four and a half months difference. Oh, yeah. Compared to just over the line in Pawtucket from Attleboro. Absolutely. So I'm thankful for that. And I think that that was the biggest thing that I was like, wow, I can't believe that. It's, it's, I, you know, truly thought that there would be some sort of moratorium mm. that would extend it for, for a little bit, but for whatever reason, it didn't get pushed through, um, and it didn't, it didn't go through. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's okay that it didn't. I think, you know, the judges and attorneys, I think everybody's doing a good job mm. of accepting that we're in the middle of a pandemic and how to properly, um, you know, approach each and every individual situation. What do you think could have been handled better? If you had to re go back in time and form this group again and get all these policies in place, what could you all have done to, to clean it up or make it more efficient? Uh, I think having more time to develop documentation. Got it. Uh, I think that, um, you know, but you're on a fly. You know, you've never been in the middle of a pandemic, but I think, you know, some of the documentation that came out was a little bit confusing. We had to make some changes. Um, but once you applied it, you figured it out we were able to make the changes really quick, mm -hmm. uh, which was nice. Um, and I think definitely um, better communication, not between the, the between um, probably between governor's team and, and us, and just trying to 
And I don't think it's anybody's fault. I think it's just, you know, the speed of, the speed of where everything's going. Nobody's been in a pandemic. I think I would say, listen, get together and figure and, and let's, you know, figure this out so that, you know, what we're putting forward is the message that the governor is is, is putting forward. Mm. Because that that I think everybody can admit that didn't that didn't happen. Right. You know, the governor said there was a stay on evictions until July first. There was nothing. It just so happened that there were 180 cases in each courthouse, which didn't allow you to hear new cases until after July 1st. So just misworded. Yeah. So, but I think that was important to know because, you know, there are people who couldn't believe they were in court in July. Hmm. So, and so early in July. So do you want to jump into Safe Harbor? Yeah. So the Safe Harbor program um, is being run by United Way of Rhode Island. It's uh, $7 million. Um, and United Way, um, you know, put this program together. Uh, and there is a whole application process. Both the landlord and the tenants need to agree to enter this program. And what if the tenant or the landlord doesn't agree? Then there's no deal. To there's be no in. deal to be had. They both have to agree. It's voluntary, and then they go into some sort of mediation to determine how much rent is due and owing, how much the landlord will receive, and what um, uh, you know uh, the, the landlord will, will give some some concessions. Normally, it's listen. I'm gonna I'm gonna work on a payment plan before just sending a five day demand notice. Um, when the rent's late, I'm going to, you know, try to, uh, you know, I'll let the tenant stay, I'll reinstate the tenancy, I'll dismiss a case if it's outstanding. So the, the landlord will make those concessions and the tenant will get the rent paid. But the tenant also has to have a job. The tenant has to try to make, you know, good faith efforts to pay rent. And the tenant has to have had issues after March 1st through, you know, the next nine months. So to yeah. the end of August. Hmm. Um, so if, if it happened before, so in if they got laid off in February or January, they wouldn't qualify. Um, but and they qualify. I think it's up to five thousand dollars. It it could be a really good program. Um, I you know in in you know I spoke a lot with um, Kim Ahern. Um, she developed it. She was leading and she did a great job immersing herself into really the landlord tenant process mm. procedures and relationship and how it works, how the laws work, um, how the Rhode Island Landlord Tenant Act applies. Um, you know, and on the fly and in two months and and you know. I think that's something that, you know, Murray, Steve, and myself, what I'll tell you, it took us a good seven to ten years to yeah. really, you know, grasp and, and understand. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I, I think it's hard because you have tenant advocacy groups, and then you obviously have a landlord advocacy group, mm -hmm. um, you know, all want something different. And, you know, bottom line is you're taking the roof away from somebody. Mm. So that's, that's, the end, that's the end result. But how do you, you know... How do you avoid that? How do you get there? And how do you do that in a way that all of a sudden now, a year from now, in 2021, as the pandemic's ending, our foreclosure is going to pick up because of everything that you do. So you want to avoid that. Mm. Um, and that, it's very difficult, um, two very difficult things to weigh. Hmm. So let's go back to the United Way program. Say you're a landlord at home, your tenant owes you for maybe just August. Mm -hmm. They owe you 1000 bucks in rent. What do they do? So I would, if I would go to United Way of Rhode Island or call 211 and ask for the flyer and provide and, and meet with your tenant and say, hey, listen, I'm interested in, a lot, in, in working with you for this program. I'll agree to accept rent from United Way if you're willing to apply. And it's a really easy process. The landlord really just has to provide a W-9, and the tenant just has to fill out paperwork and provide proof that they've been out of work since March 1st, and they haven't paid their rent since March 1st. And the landlord will work with you. That's how the parties would get together. If I was a landlord, I'd grab that form and I'd go talk to the tenant. Because you're not going to be in court for another two months. So, Easily. you know, you might as well try to grab some money and work with the tenant. Um, even though, you, you know, it's going to push back when you send a new five day, when you get into court. It's still going to allow you to capture some funds, maybe catch up if you've fallen behind on the mortgage because you've got a couple people behind. Mm -hmm. I, I think, it, you know, it could be helpful. I don't think it's all, all for naught. Some people think it's all for naught. I just, I don't see that. I, I think there are some benefits. So another thing in my interview with Steve, you can check that out, is he says that he thinks the best way to handle this is not do this back and forth paperwork shuffle, is have whoever or whatever organization sit in court and write a check to whatever eviction's going on. So you have an eviction against, you know, John Doe versus Casey Smith. Casey Smith comes in, it's a thousand bucks, and the rep is there and says, All right, here's the check, thousand dollars, this is dismissed, here's the check to the landlord, sign here. Why doesn't that work? And why do we need faxing and paperwork and? Well, you need paperwork because you don't want you just don't want to start handing out money. But if it's in court, then it's legit. There's an eviction that's been. Filed. I, I I agree with that. You know, um, 
and, and Massachusetts has something similar. They have the raft program and they have tenancy, you know, a tenancy preservation program. In Massachusetts, if you don't know, housing is a fundamental right, so it's treated very differently. It's much harder to evict somebody or remove somebody in Massachusetts hmm. from a property. And it takes Rhode Island, longer. it's not a fundamental right. It's not a fundamental right, no. So um, it takes probably an extra 30 to 60 days to, to evict somebody in Massachusetts at a minimum. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I, I think you, you want to have, you want to have a file, you want to have, you, you want to have the proper research, um, and you want to make sure that the landlord and tenant are, are on the same page, and you want to make sure there isn't, there isn't fraud in, involved, because, um, you know, and you want to make sure that the landlord is, is properly accounting accounting for the money. Got it. Um, you want to make sure that the tenant is staying in the unit mm. because what if the tenant comes in and isn't staying in the unit and just says, listen, if the landlord says, hey, listen, let's go to court, give get me four something. grand and I'll waive the other three. You know, just get me something. They got to they gotta confirm that the tenant's living there. True. They've got to confirm that there isn't any funny games going on behind the scenes because that happens a lot. True. You know, go get me 50% of my money for this program, I'll waive it. So you really, you've got to put some protections in place. Hmm. You do. I mean, you see it a lot. You see, you know, I've seen landlords and tenants, the agreements they come in with and, and the text messages they show. You know, I, I think, you know, the $7 million, which you can do a lot of good, you know, divide that by 3500 to, to 4000 and that's probably how many homes you're going to be able to help. Um, so you think that it's enough money to, to satisfy the, the surge that's coming? No, oh no. They no. would probably need thirty five or forty million. Oh. So. And are you are you counting like commercial spaces in No. That? There's no co no. Commercial is a, a beast of its own. That's business to business. Um and, and those you would think be there's gonna be thirty or forty million dollars in unpaid rent in Rhode Island? I would think so. As a between, result of this? I would think there's going to be over over i and I'm talking over the year, you know, from March first through next March first. You know, if, if the pandemic, let's say, lasts a year at a minimum, I would I would say yeah. So, wow. Well, there's 10,000 cases a year. So, in the average, you know, um, you got 12,000 cases a year. What's the average rent doing on about five five grand? So it's at five million, right there. So maybe maybe oh, maybe a little less, but uh, there's gonna, it's going to have to be more money. Hmm. But I, I would say if you had 30 million, you you you'd be safe. Wow. And we're a small state. Right. Imagine what, like, Florida, New York, even Mass Massachusetts, Massachusetts, where it's more expensive. So you're talking hundreds of millions, if not B. The, the, the numbers I've read are billions of dollars in rent. That that's what I'm basing my numbers off of. Is, so where's all that I've money read. going? All this unpaid rent. What part of the economy do you think it's headed to? Well, you've got to worry about foreclosures in a year, where the property owners can pay their mortgages. That's the issue, or does it just get wiped away? Because you know, collection attorneys, you know this, rarely take tenant collections <laughs> yeah. because you don't collect from tenants. Right. You know, try telling property, all these new property owners coming into court, oh, you're never going to collect a penny, so let's just get them out as quick as possible. Wow. So, and, and, and that's a hard pill to swallow. I heard something yesterday, I think it was on, uh, might have been on Fox Business, that said there's going to be 30 to 40 million people that are evicted or homeless from a foreclosure. I wouldn't say from a foreclosure. I don't see that happening. Like they get kicked out on the street. I don't know what the number was in the in the Great Recession, which is probably a depression, but that's another story. This for was accounting day. evictions and Oh evictions okay, yeah. That together. yeah. So if you read there's a really good article um, by a property management company out of Chicago. I think it was called Kastner. Kastner. Um, but uh, you know, they talk about it and they talk about the number of, of evictions and it's it's gonna be high. It's gonna be probably you know, but, uh, you know, I, I, the number I saw was um, 13 million properties are at risk of eviction. Hmm. So whatever the um, average number of occupants of those properties are, you know, multiply that by 13. Two or three. So, yeah. yeah. So you're looking at 20, 25 to, to 30 million. Wow. So, yeah. And do you ever think that something like this would happen? Like, did you ever think there'd be this mass you know, casualty eviction event? I mean, we just had one during the Great Recession. So that was, you know, that was crazy enough. But to you have a second one within 10 years? I don't know if it's going to be worse. 
because I think, you know, I think the difference is in the recession, there was, you know, it kind of spiraled out of, out of control. The pandemic is that part of spiraling out of control, but I think people want to get back to work. I think people want to work. People mm-hmm. want to revive the economy, not to say they didn't then, right. but I think the tools are still there to be able to capture reviving the economy, where it's going to go and, and you know, shift the, the, you know, shift the paradigm to, uh, to make the economy come back a little bit, uh, a little bit faster. Hmm. Um, and hopefully close to as strong as it was. And you think there's going to be more government aid to help property owners or tenants? Like, do you think that they've given out what they're going to give through PPP and EIDL loans and, you know, these uh, $600 stimulus boost? Do you think that that's it, or do you think there's more? Coverage? I think the tenants will get more money. I don't so. know if the landlords will, because it's, it's never the landlords worry about. Because, you know, you go to court, and anyone who owns property is a multimillionaire. Doesn't matter if they own. We're all loaded. Yeah, they don't know if they own a three-family in Woonsocket. They're a multimillionaire. If you own, you know, a house on the east side of Providence, which really is worth a million, you're a multimillionaire. Yep. You know, and you're renting that out. So it just it you know they're all looked at you know under the same light. Mm. Uh, so you know, and 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 the sexy story for the media is never the landlord. It's always the tenant. You know, right. and what's hap- what horrible things are happening to the tenant, like who's putting a garden hose in as a shower. Right. You're going to tune into that story before you tune into, you know, the oh, tenant didn't pay rent. True. And I feel like as a, as a landlord and as most of our clients I see, we need every dollar. Absolutely. Because what's the, what's the profit on, on a unit in Rhode Island? It's 175 250 Is that per bedroom or per unit? I, I just Like per month, you're saying? Yeah, per month. I would say our average client maybe makes... I mean, it's hard to know where they bought them all at, but I would say 500 bucks a month is a conservative profit. Is that for, for the whole building? Yeah. Yeah, that so. That they make at the end of the day. So you factor in three months lost rent, four months lost rent. You're talking about a year's, right. going into the second year's profit. Gone. And that's your boiler if the boiler blows and everything. Correct. Yeah, so. So that's in a perfect world. Yeah. But that's, I think they look at it like, you know what? The tenant, we can evict them, and if the landlord doesn't pay their taxes, we'll just have a tax sale, and somebody will come in, clean up the mess, and we have nothing to worry about. Then the problem is, somebody comes in and cleans up the mess, and now the rents go up. True. So, because now it's a new owner with additional expenses. So, that's something, you know, we spoke, I spoke about a lot, because I spoke with a couple of tenant advocacy, uh, individuals from the tenant advocacy group, and I said, listen, I said, you can get what you want. I said, we can shut down evictions. I said, but what are you going to do in two years when the foreclosures, when the, let's say the rents normally go up 100 bucks a month, 100 bucks a year. Now, you know, instead of going up 100 bucks a year, which would be 200 bucks, someone's going to come and raise it 350, 500 bucks in two years when they purchase this property from tax sale or foreclosure. So now, now, okay, you got what you wanted during the pandemic, but now three years from now you're going to you're going to scream, oh, how broke is the system? But you didn't you're you didn't want to give any concessions during the pandemic, okay. so. Where where do we go? What do we do? So it's a fine. It's a, it's. I don't even think it's a fine line, um, but there, I think there's a line that that doesn't need to be crossed. So Mike, what do you think my next question is going to be? Ah, uh, well, I have no clue. No clue. No clue. My next question is: What is the best advice that you ever got from anybody, personally or professionally? The best advice I ever got from anybody. Ooh, that's a that's a that's a good question. You get a lot of advice in in, in this present. In <laughs> I I think the best advice always is uh, you know um, for for business um, is you know make sure you take the emotions out of it. Mm. Um, always make sure you know do do what you can and sl- and you know the best advice for life is always sleep on it. So my dad always told me sleep on it. You know if you don't like something. You know, or if something's bothering you, you need to make a big decision, make your decision, sleep on it, and see how it feels in the morning. So, I've always done that. Never made a, never made a quick decision. I'll make a decision, but um, I, will, I will sleep on it. So, and you just kind of gave that advice. We were just talking about a client that we have an issue with who called Mike and said, blah, 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 Greg at Nexus. And you said, what? I said, well, I I'm going to let her uh, sleep on it. No, I, I well, no, I didn't <laughs> let her sleep on it. I said, uh, you know, I said everybody's a, a little upset right now. Yeah. I said, let's uh, let's take 48 hours. Yep. See if we can let cooler heads prevail, and then we'll we'll circle back around and, and talk about it. Beautiful. Um, 
so yeah, and you know, uh, you know, people, I, I give that advice all the time. I think that, you know, is the number one thing that will uh, upset clients um, because, you know, they want to resolve now. So, but a lot of times I'll, I'll tell a client something and they'll call me back or they'll email me and I'll, I'll purposely not call them back or talk to them about the situation until the next day. Hmm. Or sometimes I, I will purposely wait the second day, which I know they're going to be upset. Yeah. You know, and I'll call them, I'll say, listen, I'm sorry, but I'm able to speak to them in a much calmer, more relaxed manner to where they can really think things through. They've thought about what we've talked about. And then they, they get to the conclusion they need to get about to get rid of the headache. Mm. Um, you know, and that, that was another thing always, you know, that, which ties into all that. Is get rid of your headaches. Mm. You don't need your headaches. You don't need to sleep on them. You don't need to deal with them. Yep. Um, you know, just get, and that's, I think, why I'm so quick. Like, if a client is a bad client, like, if a client, I've had clients text me on Thanksgiving. I've had clients text, you know, they'll email. They love to email on Sunday nights. Have a couple of drinks at the at the family picnic on a Sunday, and let's get angry and go home and email my attorney. Mm -hmm. Those clients don't last long with me because, listen, you're 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 overly emotional. You don't want to think about it. You're mad that I'm not responding to you on a on a on a Thursday or a Sunday. Thanks for blowing up my spot. Now people know I respond to you on a Sunday. Um, but uh, but no, I think I think it's really but key. I earned that. You did, yeah. Years and years of professional, calm, efficient reciprocation and behavior correct i earned that sunday email so maybe you don't get that it's because you didn't get there yet mike mike has his scale we all have our scale well it, it's not yeah and you just it, you have to get there in a way where i know i'm going to respond and you're not going to respond within or call you and say yeah. blah, blah, blah. what's going on oh my god f that or, da, 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 right. da. it's like whoa, 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 whoa it's sunday i'm, I'm right. just trying to like get ahead of monday morning so when i jump in my car you know i've got my list of phone calls i got to make on monday morning if I haven't gotten six calls by 8 o'clock, because um, I can always look at my call log on the phone, uh, what came into the office. Um, you know, and there are Monday mornings. There's any morning of the week. I'll look it up, four or five calls by, you know, 7.45, right. 8, 8.50 in the morning. Mm -hmm. You know, go through those calls. You know, you, pri you prioritize them. Go through. Um, but, you know, yeah, I, I you know, you want to make sure that person isn't going to respond in a completely emotional way. And we're all guilty. I mean, I, I, I do it all the yeah. time. You know, I mean, I, you know, it's, 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 it's the nature of the beast. It's, mm -hmm. the, you know, we're dealing with, you're dealing with money. I always tell people, landlords are, when they're not getting money, you know, they're worried about next month's mortgage. Because I have cases. I, I was involved in a $13 million Ponzi scheme case. In Rhode Island? No, in Massachusetts. I have my landlords who are not getting $800 in rent were more emotional than the parties in the $13 million Ponzi scheme case on my side. What was the Ponzi scheme case? Like, so, not details, but like in a nutshell. So there was a, there was a gentleman who started um, uh, a, an investment company, um, and he was supposedly investing in real estate, hard money lending. Um, and he, was, he had um, suckered in this, this whole family into the Ponzi, Ponzi scheme. Um, it, and, and not only that, friends of the, of the family. Um, and they were all successful, well-to-do people, um, and they lost life savings. Um, and what would and, he say? Oh, I'm taking your money, Mrs. Jones and Mr. Jones, and I'm buying this real estate. And he would have a list of all the properties. He would show them all, and, and he would go, go through. And it was, it was really, uh, you know, um, it, it was really too bad. Um, and, and, you know, he would, he would have payouts for everybody like it was interest. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, um, you know, we still have one active case. So, um, you know, that's kind of the, the bird's eye view. What um, happens to those people? Is that like a, what, what's the charge? He went to jail for 10 years. What's the charge on that? Is that so like embezzlement. A, embezzlement? Correct. Um, you know, there's uh, RICO issues. Hmm. Um, so, and the SEC gets involved, so there's charges out of the SEC because you're, quote, unquote, investing. Um, so it's it's pretty bad, but him and his wife uh, both went to jail, and I think it's or him and his son went to jail, and his wife avoided jail. I can't remember exactly, um, but uh, but he should be getting out. Crazy, he's getting out of jail soon. But uh, but yeah, there was um, you know it was it was it was, it was crazy, um, you know. But um, you know, it's nothing you can do. You feel bad because I really got to know my client very well. Uh, will always be one of my favorite clients um, hmm. till the day I retire. But they handled it better than the eight hundred dollar rent guy. Yes, like she would get emotional. She would get upset, um, but the eight hundred dollar rent guy—if you put on a scale of, of emotions, 
communications to me, everything, the $800 rent guy wins every time. Every time. I mean, it's, I, and I feel bad for the $800 rent guy. Don't get me wrong, but I'm just like, you know, a perspective. I'm, in my head, I'm like... And if he only knew... This lady lost, lost her life. I mean, her, her absolute life. And, and, and I just, every time I just kind of laugh. So. What, does that woman have any recourse? Is there any type she, of like, she didn't. I can't get too far into it, but she she never has any any recourse. Like, um, is there a, a program the government sets up, like a safety net for people that are victims of RICO no. violations? Oh, no. Or no, and then you know the worst part is people love attorneys, right? So the worst part is uh, this guy who set up a Ponzi scheme declared bankruptcy. So then the U.S. trustee gets involved, and then he bills. You know, uh, you know their their court appointed U.S. trustee. So then he bills against whatever they were able to claw back. They call it clawing back. So whatever money they were able to claw back, he bills like, a, you know, three, four hundred thousand dollars I'm like, Ugh. I'm like, there was no reason for you to clear bankruptcy and do this. Some guy could have done this for, you know, 100, 150,000 bucks, you know, or, you know, but, so that, you know, you watch all of that and you're like, man, you're like, this, how do you this get gonna... paid in that? My client has to pay me. So even though she lost all her money, she still got to cough up. Correct. Wow. And she needed an attorney for this one. Oh yeah. So she had, you know, there, there was, there were, you know, um, allegations and, and all that which we had to defend. So you don't do any like criminal cases. You do kind of business. I don't. Or, uh, yeah, real estate things. litigation. Um, some some litigation. Um, this was, you know, I was representing the wife of somebody in this, so I wasn't at, at the time as it started out. I wasn't knee deep into it, um, but uh, I, I, we definitely ended up knee deep in it. But. Um, uh, you know, it's mainly, you know, the landlord-tenant work, I'll do transactional work, um, and then, um, you know, real estate litigation. So give me something, if you're at home thinking, oh, can I hire Mike? Give me something that just falls outside of your scope of work. And I'll give you an example. Like, we can't be hired if the owner lives in the rental property. It's still a rental property. There's still tenants, but the owner lives there. So we look at it like ball of wax. Right. I'm sorry. So give me your equivalent of that, that you can't be hired for, but it's close to your business. Well, I would say, you know, the one thing we don't do a lot of is tenant work. Um, so we have tenants call, you know, I advertise, unlike Conti and, and, and Murray. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, they, they, they both claim to have never advertised. Um, but I do advertise, and it works for me. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know how much I believe them. I think when they started out, they probably did some advertising. <laughs> um, you know, I think they're, you know, pounding their chest a little too hard. Yeah. Let's take that. Um, but, uh, but we get a lot of tenants' calls for my advertising. Um, and so, you know, we, we have to run a conflict check, but we refer most of them out. Um, we, you know, every so often we'll speak to a tenant, um, depending on what type of tenant. You know, I don't represent uh, just because of the way it is. And, and they're, they're with attorneys who I don't, you know, I'll never steal business. I just don't do it. I, yep. I have way too, you know, too much respect for the system, for the practice, and we're all, there's enough for all of us. So there's uh, the student housing. I don't represent any of the student housing people down by URI, up Got by it. PC. So I get every May and every September, I get anywhere between, you know, three and six calls from, you know, either landlords that don't return a security deposit, which is usually pretty great, yeah. you know, at that time, or, you know, properties that weren't ready um, because summer, summer rentals didn't move mm -hmm. out, or, um, you know, what are the kids going to do? How do they get their money back? Um, or landlords that just weren't ready, like, tried to rent to students and just weren't ready to rent to students. They didn't understand gotcha. what was going to happen. Um, so uh, those are the type of tenants that, that I represent um, in, in that case. Um, and then uh, if, if you called me and said, hey, listen, you know, my mom or my brother or my cousin's a tenant, I would represent a tenant in that case. Okay. But normally it falls out of the scope of, of what we do. Uh, one thing I do refer out, I will take certain cases from property management companies, but hmm. from one-offs I won't, is if they're fighting or arguing with their city or town, hmm. um, that, you know, sometimes I, I won't take. I'll go to housing court for violations. If, if it's gone to court and been filed, that's a large part of my practice, actually, is going to housing court hmm. and fighting those violations. Um, and I'm very familiar with that. Um, so and I, I've, I've made some good inroads. But if someone wants to go fight about zoning or variance or, you know, the big one is the illegal apartments, everybody. Um, yeah. Which, which you know, a, we can, uh... yeah, uh, we can talk about that next. <laughs> um, but no, oh, actually, I'm not even, I'm not even referring to that. I just overall, I get calls on illegal apartments all the time. Oh. Um, that's, a, that's a huge call. And I, I just don't, my advice, well, let's, let's, let's go back. I won't take, like, like, those types of cases against the city or town. Because 
The reason why is because it's going to cost somebody ten or fifteen thousand mm-hmm. dollars. It's going to cost you four thousand dollars to tear down the mm-hmm. the property. And I always tell people this: you can pay me ten or fifteen thousand dollars. There's no guarantee. There's a su- Supreme Court case which says they don't have to rule in your favor just because it's been a, a, a livable unit and they've taxed you on it for 40 years. If it's not zoned that way, they can pull it. But it can be taxed that way. You can put somebody in there for 40 years, but if, it's, if you never went to zoning, they can pull it. And it, all it takes is one person to be upset about the way it is, and you will not, they will not grant you that, that zoning variance Happy or that zoning me. exception. Yeah, so I, I don't take those cases because I don't, you know, the mom and pops who come off, they don't, they don't have an extra 10 or 50. And they're just going to be mad at the result right. 99% of the times. So, um, and I'm very familiar with the case because uh, an attorney that I respect was on one side of the case and an attorney that I live with when she was at the city of Providence uh, was on the other side of the, the superior court side of that case. Wow. And then we had a kid, so she couldn't argue the Supreme Court. So I'm very familiar with the case. That's the other reason I tell people. I say, listen, I, I know where this is going. It's probably not going to end well. Got it. And the other one I do, the other cases that I don't take are people call me purchase and sale disputes. They buy the property and they find a problem with it. Mm. First question is how much is it going to be? Re- or contractor cases. How much is how much was the was the repair? Fifteen to twenty. All right, you can pay me somewhere between seventy five hundred and twenty thousand to fight this case. I go, you're going to get nowhere. Or if you prevail, you're going to pay me seventy five to twenty thousand, and the insurance company is going to write you a check for fifteen to twenty thousand. So what do you want to do? <laughs> okay. So, and and you know I have sometimes they get mad at me. I'll, I'll meet with them, but. You know, I, I do, I, that's the one thing I do that probably, you know, a businessman would shake at is at some point I just ignore the calls. Like, yeah. I'm not taking your money. Yeah. And I've had people call me and say, you know, after, hey, listen, you were right. You know, I just want to tell you I was right. You are, sorry, you were right that, hey, I, I gave that guy 15000 and I got a check for eight. So, you know. Tomatoes, it's, tomatoes. Yeah. You know, and I, do, I tell you that all the time. You do. You, you send me people and I'm like, listen, we'll send a letter. You know, let's let's spend five hundred to to, to fifteen hundred bucks, but we're, it's not worth it to send anything right. else like that. Agreed. So, and, and see what they're willing to do. So. So how about this? What's your least favorite part of your job? My least favorite part of the job. I love court, but going to court every day, and I tell you, it's 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 because it you, you fall behind. You do. You fall behind in the phone calls. Yep. You fall behind in the paperwork. Mm-hmm. And you fall behind in the emails, and then it's. All right, when do I have two hours to go through these emails? Right. And it's not that I hate it. It's just you feel bad because you want to get back to everybody. Yep. You know, like I said, I get rid of the clients I don't like. So the clients that I like, I want to get back to. Mm-hmm. And I want to, I want to put them at ease, especially if it's a Thursday or Friday going into a weekend. Because mm-hmm. now they got to wait till Monday. So there's a lot of times I'll wake up, you know, 4 or 5 in the morning, and I'm like, oh, I forgot to respond. Let me respond to these emails. Yep. Get this out. That way they feel good. I'm not worried about it. I'm not going to go out with my kids on a Saturday and then be like, oh, I didn't do this. You know, that's going to bother me. And now it's taking my, you know, my concentration and train of thought away from the family and those right. things. So you kind of feel behind the eight ball because you're driving, you're parking, you're getting something at the cafe. You're like, there's no service at Kent County anyway. Correct. Yep. So it's like all of these things. And then you get back and you're settled. It's four o'clock. And then Shelly, the landlord, oh, yeah. is like, bah! The phone rings, sure enough. And you're like, ah. Yeah, like my phone, like I took Friday off. I took a, a staycation with the family. Phone rang twice all day. Wow. And I'm thinking, man, I could have been in the office. I could be caught up today. Yep. You know, coming today. And, you know, I was just, just you know, I got, you know, kind of got in my groove. And then, of course, here's the phone. Here's the phone. So. And then, oh, shit, I got to go to Greg's interview. I know. I, I, this was on the calendar. That's good. <laughs> so this, this was planned for. So how about this, right? I'm trying to get an interview with Rob Levine, the heavy hitter. I want to interview Rob. I want to talk about, he's an interesting guy, okay? <coughs> he was a Central Falls police officer, Correct. a paramedic, like kind of different, and mm-hmm. then sees that there's a need for this business. What's your experience or, uh, you know, opinion of the industry, of the personal injury, the slip and falls? Like, what's your overall, as an attorney, your just your, your gut reaction? I think that? overall it's needed. Um, you know, I, I think it's needed because I think you need to, I think it, it forces people to be responsible. Mm. Um, cause there's a lot of landlords, you know, you've got, you've got your slumlords, whatever. Um, but I think there's a lot of people who, you know, cut corners. Um, and, but I think there's a lot of people who don't cut corners because of that industry. Um, do I think there is too many claims being filed on certain slip and falls for apartments? 
mm -hmm. um, and things like that. Absolutely, I do. Um, and 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 I think um, I think that part has has been a little out of control. But I think also there's too many stories of decks collapsing and decks falling. And, we get those and, like you know once a year. <laughs> yeah. So I fell down the stairs at West Forward. We go and literally the whole staircase. Yeah. Fell. Yeah. So <laughs> I think and you know I, I think you have to keep people accountable and keep I people responsible, know. especially for those the, the decks and the stairs. I mean, I represented a guy once. And you know he was in he was in Providence Housing Court, and I got a call that said, "Hey, can you come represent me?" I called the solicitor. He said, and I had I had been down there a lot. He said, "Listen," he said, "If you're going to enter and advise him, I know you're going to give him the right advice." We were actually going to ask to have him locked up because he won't do anything at this property, and he's allowing the tenants to stay. Um, drop ceilings falling, both stairwells. One stairwell was completely so two two, you know means of ingress and egress, mm. one was completely falling apart, basically falling off the house, the whole nine yards. The other one had issues. I mean, the whole house was, was falling apart. And, you know, the guy, guy, the guy was, you know, he had a couple well-known businesses. Um, so, you know, it was, it's, you know, it, and, and when you represent, not him, but, but other people like that, they kind of look at you and go, well, I, I can't afford it. I can't do it. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, you bought a business. You got to keep the business up. Why are you not keeping your business up to, up to snuff? Um, so you really, they, you know, I, I think, I think they kind of get what comes to them, mm -hmm. you know, when, when, when you get to slip and fall and those types of things. Because what are you going to do? I mean, you know, you didn't take care of your property, you know, and then you call me and say, oh, they went to Rob Levine. And I said, well, when was the last time you fixed the step that was broken? I was broken for three months, but they didn't learn to step around it. Well, what about this, Mike? Ooh. What about the um, just the the amount of claims that are sent out that are fruitless? Oh, yeah, that's that part's out of control. But what is the the remedy for that? Like the tenant can go to Rob Levine or Sparks or any of these guys and just say, "Hey, this happened," and then the paralegal will ship out a letter <clears throat> threatening this and mm -hmm. send it to your insurance carrier. And by law, <coughs> in Rhode Island. You have to give that to your insurance. Right. Is that correct? Yes. By law, you have to provide your insurance information to the other side. So that letter, in turn, by law, results in a claim correct. against the... Whether good or bad. Whether correct. good or bad. Yeah. And then the landlord has to settle. How do you stop just the, the abuse? I think the insurance companies stop it by denying all those claims. They have to start denying more claims. But is it... But I think they pay out on claims because the cost-benefit analysis, right? Get rid of the claim but before then my it costs premium too much. goes up, or they drop me next year. Correct. Yeah. Or if you didn't report it to them and they found out you gave them a thousand bucks, now they're dropping you as well. So it's you know, it's uh, it's it's difficult. I, part of it's a necessary evil, mm. but but I think part of it needs to go away. What needs to go away? The the frivolous claims. The amount of frivolous claims. The amount of, I, I would love to know, and, and you know, just, just, just for my own edification, just to know, how many three to $6,000 claims are paid out? Mm. So those are probably your, your more frivolous 90%. claims. 90%. Yeah. <laughs> it, it could be. So, you know, it, it really could be, but I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, but, the, but there is a need, and, and it is a necessary requirement. Mm, I agree. You know, I don't even think it's a, a, you know, I don't even think it's an evil. I think necessary evil is bad language. I think it's necessary mm. um, to, to, Make people responsible and, and make them accountable. Yeah, it kind of, it's like a seesaw. Correct. It keeps it. Correct. And there's going to be abuse in any system that Absolutely. is created, any procedure. Right. So, hmm. nope, I, I, I completely agree. But, uh, but it's, you know, I mean, we see it. We see it all the time. Landlords refuse to accept money and then they'll come in and file an on payment case. Hmm. So, we, we have that in our industry. The wheels so. of justice churn. Slowly. Always, always turning. So, you know, but uh, you just, you know, my whole thing is you got to pay attention to it and you got to be honest and, and you got to be forthcoming and just tell your clients the truth and what's going to happen, whether they like it or not. Great advice. So, so the last thing, and uh, it's a shame that the package didn't come today in the mail. Okay. I'll put it up on the screen so you can see it. We got Mike, his own hat. Oh, yeah. Okay. And what it is, it says Mike, and then it's a picture of a crane. Perfect. Very deep thought went into I that. I like it. And like, you know, 
We, we, we spent a lot of money on it. Are you getting it. your Greg Rice hat? No. No? Why not? Greg, I thought we were going to go out Greg. with matching hats. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> But it's a it's a trucker hat, so it's it's Perfect. classy. It's, Good. You'll fit in with the younger kids. Uh, that's that's what I need. That's what you need. I need. But since we don't have that hat, I have another hat with me today. All right. That I'm gonna give you temporarily until you get your real Perfect. hat. Perfect. But you have to put it on right now. All right. You'll do it. I'll do it. All right. Uh oh. Oh, it's it's already waiting. Oh oh, I get hair today. Oh look at that. So, it's, put it uh, on and let's see how it fits. All right, there we go. Holland Mood Truck and Service. There we go. So, <laughs> so Mike, for now, this is your hat. Perfect. All right. Sounds good. Hey, I'll have hair. My kids may not recognize me. <laughs> thanks, Greg. Mike, thanks again. And if folks at home want to get in touch with you, how should they do so? Uh, the best way is to call my office. You know, 401-400-2529. Or you can email me at mcrane at mcranelaw.com. So that's 401 400 2529. So, and easy to remember. keep the emotions out of it. He's Absolutely. a busy guy. Don't bother him with a half hour phone call. That could take 30 seconds instead. Yeah, you know, but sometimes you got to explain the stuff to him. But, but just um, keep the overall. fluff out. Exactly. Well, yeah, yeah, that's never going to happen. <laughs> that's never going to happen. <laughs> Conti and I don't put up with the fluff. Murray does. That's you what I was saying. You call Mike tell him. or you call Conti, and it's like you literally feel like. They're ready to hang up the phone because they're so, they already know what you're saying and have the answer. It's like you guys are so much better. And you have to get efficient on the phone. Yeah, you've got to. I mean, we're dealing with, you know, you think about the amount of people we're dealing with. I talked, you know, I spoke to another attorney and I said, you know, how many cases do you deal with a year? And he said 50 to 60. So, you know, he's filing 50 to 60 new cases a year. You're doing 10 Conti's times filing, that. Yeah, I'm doing 10 times that and Conti's doing, you know, almost 20 times that. So, you know, you got, you got to tell people, you give them the information, and, and yep. you go from there. Um, and I think they only put, put up with us because if they call another attorney, they're going to charge them 1000 for the eviction, and we charge 500 <laughs> That's the only reason they put up with it. So we know that. We're not. You know, we weren't born yesterday. So Cool. Again, Mike Craig. Hey, no problem. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me. And if you have any questions for me, post a comment below. We'll get right back to you. Once again, Greg Rice from Nexus Property Management, your property managed.